Story 5 of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, Ten Christmas Stories by Edward Everett Hale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 5, Stand and Wait, Parts 3 and 4. 3. Christmas Again so you think that when the war was over major bartho then major general remembered huldah all the same and came on and persuaded her to marry him and that she is now sitting in her veranda looking down on the pamunkey river you think that do not you well you were never so mistaken in your life if you want that story you can go and buy yourself a dime novel I would buy The Rescued Rebel or The Noble Nurse, if I were you. After the war was over, Huldah did make Colonel Bartho and his wife a visit once at their plantation in Pocataglio County, but I was not there and know nothing about it. Here is a Christmas of hers, about which she wrote a letter, and as it happens, it was a letter to Mrs. Bartho. Huldah Root to Agnes Bartho Villiers Bocage, December 27, 1868. Here I was then, after this series of hopeless blunders, sole alone at the Gare, French for station, of this little out of the way town. My dear, there was never an American here since Christopher Columbus slept here when he was a boy. And here, you see, I was like to remain for there was no possibility of the others getting back to me till to-morrow, and no good in my trying to overtake them. All I could do was just to bear it, and live on and live through from Thursday to Monday, and really what was worst of all was that Friday was Christmas Day. Well, I found a funny little carriage with a funny old man who did not understand my patois any better than I did his, but he understood a frank piece. I had my guide-book, and I said auberge, and we came to the oddest, most outlandish, and old-fashioned establishment that ever escaped from one of Julia Natalie Woman's novels. And here I am. And the reason, my dear Mrs. Bartho, that I take to-day to write to you, you and the Colonel will now understand. You see, it was only ten o'clock when I got here. Then I went to walk, many enfants terribles following respectfully then i came home and ate the funny refection then i got a nap then i went to walk again and made a little sketch in the churchyard and this time one of the children brought up her mother a funny norman woman in a delicious costume i have a sketch of another just like her and she dropped a courtesy and in a very mild patois said she hoped the children did not trouble madame and I said, oh, no, and found a sugar-plum for the child, and showed my sketch to the woman, and she said she supposed Madame was Anglaise. I said I was not Anglaise, and here the story begins, for I said I was American, and do you know, her face lighted up as if I had said I was St. Golda, or St. Hilda, or any of their northern saints. American, as il possible, as il possible, Jeanette, Gertrude, faites vos reverences, madame est américaine. And sure enough, they all dropped preternatural courtesies, and then the most eager enthusiasm. How fond they were of les américaines, but how no américain had ever come before. And was madame at the three signettes? And might she and her son and her husband call to see madame at the three signettes? and might she bring a little etrenne to madame and i know not what beside i was very glad the national reputation had gone so far i really wished i were charles sumner pardon me dear agnes that i might properly receive the delegation but i said oh certainly and as it grew dark with my admiring cortege whispering now to the street full of admirers that madame was american i returned to the three signettes and in the evening they all came really you should see the pretty basket they brought for an etren i could not guess then where they got such exquisite flowers 
these lovely stephanotis blossoms a perfect wealth of roses and all arranged with charming taste in a quaint country basket such as exists nowhere but in this particular section of this quaint old normandy in came the husband dressed up and frightened but thoroughly good in his look in came my friend and then two sons and two wives and three or four children and my dear agnes one of the sons i knew him in an instant was a man we had at talbot court house when your husband was there i think the colonel will remember him a black-whiskered man who used to sing a little song about le vin rouge of bourgogne he did not remember me that i saw in a moment it was all so different you know in the hospital i had on my cap and apron and here well it was another thing my hostess knew that they were coming and had me in her largest room and i succeeded in making them all sit down and i received my formal welcome and i thanked in my most parisian french and then the conversation hung fire but i took my turn now and turned round to poor louis you served in america did you not said i ah oh, yes madame i did not know my mother had told you no more did she indeed and she looked astonished but i persevered you seem strong and well ah uh, yes madame how long since you returned as soon as there was peace madame we were mustered out in june madame and does your arm never trouble you oh never madame i did not know my mother had told you new astonishment on the part of the mother you never had another piece of bone come out oh no madame how did madame know i did not know my mother had told you and by this time i could not help saying you normans care more for christmas than do we americans is it not so my brave and this he would not stand and he said stoutly ah no madame no no jamais and began an eager defence of the religious enthusiasm of the americans and their goodness to all people who were good if people would only be good but still he had not the least dream who i was and i said uh, do the normans ever drink burgundy and to my old hostess madame could you bring us a flask du vin rouge de bourgogne and then i hummed his little chanson i am sure colonel bartho will remember it de goutte du vin rouge du bourgogne my dear mrs bartho he sprang from his chair and fell on his knees and kissed my hands before i could stop him and when his mother and father and all the rest found that i was the particular sieur de la charite who had had the care of dear louis when he was hurt and that it was i he had told of that very day for the thousandth time i believe who gave him that glass of claret and cheered up his christmas i verily believe they would have taken me to the church to worship me they were not satisfied the women with kissing me or the men with shaking hands with each other the whole aubert had to be called in and poor i was famous i need not say i cried my eyes out and when at ten o'clock they let me go to bed i was worn out with crying and laughing and talking and listening and i believe they were as much upset as i now that is just the beginning and yet i see i must stop but for forty-eight hours i have been simply a queen i can hardly put my foot to the ground christmas morning these dear thibault people came again and then the cure came and then some nice madame perron came and i went to mass with them and after mass their brother's carriage came and they would take no refusals but with many apologies to my sweet old hostess at the three signettes i was fain to come up to monsieur firmin's lovely chateau here and make myself at home till my friends shall arrive it seems the poor Thibaults had come here to beg the flowers for the etrenne it is really the most beautiful country residence i have seen in france and they live on the most patriarchal footing with all the people round them i am sure i ought to speak kindly of them it is the most fascinating hospitality 
so here i am waiting with my little sac de nuit to make me a spadbille, and here i ate my christmas dinner tell the colonel that here is the traveller's tale and that is why the letter is so long most truly yours Holda root four one christmas more this last christmas party is Holda's own it is hers at least as much as it is any one's there are five of them nay six with equal right to precedence in the john o groats house where she has settled down it is one of those comfortable houses which are still left three miles out from the old state house in boston it is not all on one floor that would be perhaps too much like the golden courts of heaven there are two stories but they are connected by a central flight of stairs of easy tread designed by charles cummings so easy and so stately withal that as you pass over them you always bless the builder and hardly know that you go up or down five large rooms on each floor give ample room for the five heads of the house if indeed there be not six as i said before into this saint's rest there have drifted together by the eternal law of attraction Holda and ellen philbrick who was with her in virginia and in france and has been indeed but little separated from her except on duty for twenty years and with them three other friends these women well i cannot introduce them to you without writing three stories of true romance one for each this quiet strong meditative helpful saint who is coming into the parlor now is helen turo she was left alone with her baby when the empire state went down and her husband was never heard of more the love of that baby warmed her to the love of all others and when i first knew her she was ruling over a home of babies whose own mothers or fathers were not always with a heart big enough to say there was room for one more waif in that sanctuary that older woman who is writing at the davenport in the corner lightened the cares and smoothed the daily life of general schuyler in all the last years of his life when he was in the cabinet in brazil and in louisiana his wife was long ill and then died his children needed all a woman's care and this woman stepped to the front cared for them cared for all his household cared for him and i dare not say how much is due to her of that which you and i say daily we owe to him miss peters i see you know she served in another regiment was at the head of the sweetest noblest purest school that ever trained in five and twenty years five hundred girls to be the queens in five hundred happy and strong families all of these five are huldah and mrs philbrick too you have seen before all of them have been in the service all of them have known that perfect service is perfect freedom i think they know that perfect service is the highest honor they have together taken this house as they say for the shelter and home of their old age but Hulda, as she plays with your harry there does not look to me as if she were superannuated yet but you said there were six in all did i i suppose there are mrs philbrick are there five captains in your establishment or six my dear mr hale why do you ask me you know there are five captains and one general we have persuaded seth corbett to make his home here yes the same who went round the world with mrs craddock since her death he has come home to boston and he reports to us and makes his headquarters here he sees that we are all right every morning and then he goes his rounds to see every grandchild of old mr craddock and to make sure that every son and daughter of that house is all right sometimes he is away overnight this is when somebody in the whole circle of all of their friends is more sick than usual and needs a man nurse that old man was employed by old mr craddock in eighteen sixteen when he first went to housekeeping he has had all the sons and all the daughters of that house in his arms and now that the youngest of them is five-and-twenty and the oldest fifty 
I suppose he is not satisfied any day until he has seen that they and theirs, in their respective homes, are well. He thinks we here are babies, but he takes care of us all the more courteously. Will he dine with you to-day? I am afraid not, but we shall see him at the Christmas tree after dinner. There is to be a tree. You see, this house was dedicated to the apotheosis of noble ministry. Over the mantelpiece hung Raphael Morgan's large print of the Lavazio, Carazzi's picture of the washing of the feet, the only copy I ever saw. We ask Hulda about it. Oh, that was a present from Mr. Berkstadt, a rich manufacturer in Württemberg, to Ellen. She stumbled into one of those villages when everybody was sick and dying of typhus, and tended and watched and saved one whole summer long, as Mrs. Ware did at Osmerley. And this Mr. Berkstadt wanted to do something, and he sent her this in acknowledgment. On the other side was Kaubach's own study of Elizabeth of Hungary, dropping her apron full of roses. Oh, what a sight the apron discloses! The viands are changed to real roses. When I asked Hulda where that came from, she blushed and said, Oh, that was a present to me, and led us to Steinler's exquisite Good Shepherd in a larger and finer print than I had ever seen. Six or eight gentlemen in New York, who, when they were dirty babies from the gutter, had been in Helen Turo's hands, had sent her a portfolio of beautiful prints, each with this same idea of seeking what was lost. This one she had chosen for the sitting-room, and on the fourth side was that dashing group of Horace Vernet's Gideon Crossing Jordan, with the motto wrought into the frame, Faint, yet pursuing. These four pictures are all presents to the girls, as I find I still call them, and on the easel Miss Peters had put her copy of the tribute money. There were other pictures in the room, but these five unconsciously told its story. The five girls were always all together at Christmas, but in practice each of them lived here only two-fifths of her time. We make that a rule, said Ellen, laughing. If anybody comes for anybody when there are only two here, those two are engaged to each other and we stay. Not but what they can come and stay here if we cannot go to them. In practice, if any of us in the immense circles which these saints had befriended were in a scrape, as uh, if a mother was called away from home and there were some children left, or if scarlet fever got into a house, or if the children had nobody to go to Mount Desert with them, or if the new house were to be set in order and nobody knew how, in any of the trials of well-ordered families, why, we rode over to the saints' rest to see if we could not induce one of the five to come and put things through, so that in practice there were seldom more than two on the spot there. But we do not get to the Christmas dinner. There were covers for four and twenty, and all the children besides were in a room upstairs, presided over by Maria Monroe, who was in her element there. Then our party of twenty-four included men and women of a thousand romances, who had learned and had shown the nobility of service. One or two of us were invited as novices, in the hope, perhaps, that we might learn. Scarcely was the soup served when the doorbell rang. Nothing else ever made Hulda look nervous. Bartlett, who was there, said in an aside to me that he had seen her more calm when there was volley firing within hearing of her storeroom. Then it rang again. Helen Turo talked more vehemently, and Mrs. Bartlett, at her end, started a great laugh. But when it rang the third time, something had to be said and Hulda asked one of the girls, who was waiting, if there were no one attending at the door. Yes, am Mr. Corbett. But the bell rang a fourth time and a fifth. Isabel, you can go to the door. Mr. Corbett must have stepped out. So Isabel went out, but returned with a face as broad as a soup plate. Mr. Corbett is there, ma'am. Sixth doorbell peal, seventh and eighth. "'Mary, I think you had better see if Mr. Corbett has gone away.' 
Mary returns, face one broad grin. No, ma'am, Mr. Corbett is there. Heavy steps in the red parlor, side doorbell, a little gong, begins to ring. Front bell rings ninth time, tenth and eleventh. St. John, as we call him, had seen that something was amiss, and had kindly pitched in with a dissertation on the passage of the Red River Dam, in which the gravy boats were steamships, and the cranberry was General Banks, and the aides were spoons. But when both doorbells rang together, and there were more steps in the hall, Huldah said, uh, If you will excuse me, and rose from the table. No, 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 we will not excuse you, cried Clara Hastings. Nobody will excuse you. This is the one day of the year when you are not to work. Let me go. So Clara went out, and after Clara went out, the doorbells rang no more. I think she cut the bell wires. She soon came back and said a man was inquiring his way to the smells, and they directed him to Waits Mills, which she hoped would do. And so Huldah's and Grace's stupendous housekeeping went on in its solid order, reminding one of those well-proportioned Worcester teas, which are perhaps the crown and glory of the New England science in this matter. I ventured to ask Sam Root, who sat by me, if the Marlboro were not equal to his mother's. And we sat long, and we laughed loud. We talked war and poetry and genealogy. We rallied Helen Turo about her housekeeping, and Dr. Worster pretended to give a list of surgeons and majors and major generals who had made love to Huldah. By and by, when the grapes and the bonbons came, the sixteen children were led in by Maria Monroe, who had, till now, kept them at games of string and hunt the slipper. And at last Seth Corbett flung open the door into the red parlor to announce the tree. Sure enough, there was the tree, as the five saints had prepared it for the invited children, glorious in gold and white, with wreaths of snowflakes and blazing with candles. Sam Root kissed Grace and said, Oh, Grace, do you remember? But the tree itself did not surprise the children as much as the five tables at the right and the left, behind and before, amazed the sainted five, who were indeed the children now. A box of the vin rouge de Bourgogne from Louise was the first thing my eye lighted on, and above it a little banner read, Holda's Table. And then I saw that there were these five tables heaped with the Christmas offerings to the five saints. It proved that everybody, the world over, had heard that they had settled down. Everybody in the four hemispheres, if there be four, who had remembered the unselfish service of these five, had thought this a fit time for commemorating such unselfish love, were it only by such a present as a lump of coal. Almost everybody, I think, had made Seth Corbett a confidant, and so, while the five saints were planning their pretty tree for the sixteen children, the north and the south and the east and the west were sending myrrh and frankincense and gold to them. The pictures were hung with southern moss from Bartho. Boys, who were now men, had sent coral from India, pearl from Ceylon, and would have been glad to send ice from Greenland had Christmas come in midsummer. There were diamonds from Brazil and silver from Nevada, from those who lived there. There were books, in the choicest binding, in memory of copies of the same word worn by travel or dabbled in blood. There were pictures, either by the hand of near friendship, or by the master hand of genius, which had brought back the memories, perhaps, of some old adventure in the service. Perhaps, as the cowbook did, of one of those histories which makes all service sacred. In five and twenty years of life, these women had so surrounded themselves, without knowing it or thinking of it, with loyal, yes, adoring friends, that the accident of their finding a fixed home had called in all at once this wealth of acknowledgment from those whom they might have forgotten, but who would never forget them. And by the accident of our coming together, we saw in these heaps on heaps of offerings of love 
some faint record of the lies they had enlivened, the wounds they had staunched, the tears they had wiped away, and the homes they had cheered. For themselves, the five saints, as I have called them, were laughing and crying together, quite upset in the surprise. For ourselves, there was not one of us who, in this little visible display of the range of years of service, did not take in something more of the meaning of, He who will be chief among you, let him be your servant. The surprise, the excitement, the laughter, and the tears found vent in the children's eagerness to be led to their tree. And in three minutes Ellen was opening boxes, and Huldah pulling firecrackers, as if they had not been thrown off their balance. But when each boy and girl had two arms full, and the fir balsam sent down from New Durham was nearly bare, Edgar Bartlett pointed to the top bough, where was a brilliant not noticed before. No one had noticed it, not Seth himself who had most of the other secrets of that house in his possession. I am sure that no man, woman, or child knew how the thing came there, but Seth lifted the little discoverer high in air, and he brought it down triumphant. It was a parcel made up in shining silvered paper. Seth cut the strings. It contained twelve Maltese crosses of gold, with as many jewels, one in the heart of each, I think the blazing twelve of the revelations. They were displayed on ribbons of blue and white, six of which bore Huldah's, Helen's, Ellen Philbrick's, Hannah's, Miss Peter's, and Seth Corbett's names. The other six had no names, but on the gold of these was marked from Huldah two, from Helen two, and so on, as if these were decorations which they were to pass along. The saints themselves were the last to understand the decorations, but the rest of us caught the idea and pinned them on their breasts. As we did so, the ribbons unfolded and displayed the motto of the order, Henceforth I call you not servants, I have called you friends. It was at that Christmas that the order of loving service was born. End of Story 5 Parts 3 and 4